Today's photo moment is an Ask Me Anything show, so what do you want to know? Let's talk about it. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first thrice weekly live show here on YouTube every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific, here to talk about things photo, camera, video related. If it's got a camera attached to it, and if you... <laughs> And if you like this voice in my ear sometimes, uh, and if you like us, he's reminding me to say, hey, subscribe. We did like a new thing. There's a little thing up here and you can subscribe up here. It makes it really easy. So yeah, thank you, boss man, to, uh, to, to yes, please do subscribe. It's, you know, you know how it is. We're, we're almost at 10K, which is really cool. So today's an AMA show. Let's just talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, I got toys. I'm ready to fire off questions. We're ready to fire off answers. Here's, um, here's how this works. If you're watching live, that's how you get to ask anything. If you're not watching live, you can always post a comment later, but then it's not really, it's not live. Anyway, uh, see over here, this thing that says uh, at Photo Joseph in red. If you have a question you want me to answer, do type at Photo Joseph in your question, and that way it shows up red on my screen, like you see there, and then I know that it's there and ready for me to talk about. Before the show went live, we were talking about um, iPhone 10 ordering, wondering how many people ordered an iPhone 10 and, and when it's going to arrive. The, uh, my shipping date initially when I first ordered it was 10th to 17th, but it got updated and it's coming this Friday. Mm, super excited about that, as you might imagine. Sully says, any word on the new Panasonic camera that's supposed to be announced later this year, LX200? Don't know anything about it, so there. Uh, Mark Paul Cordero says, I noticed that when filming internally to an SDXC card, okay, either in 4K or 1080p, I get some stutters as though it skipped a frame. I do not get this with the Atomos Ninja. Hmm, that's curious. It certainly should not uh, be doing that. I would say, is it just one card that you're having that with? Is it all cards? Um, have you reformatted the cards? It's, you know, sometimes people put, when they put their card back in the camera, they just hit erase everything on there. You should always reformat. It's a much cleaner way to prep the card for use. I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen skipped frames like that. That's odd. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Uh, yeah, let me know if, you, if you're reformatting the cards or not. Uh, Joshua says, in regards to HDR video editing, do you have a rec recommendation for a monitor? Ah, I can't find one for a reasonable price. There seems to be a lot more HDR TVs than monitor options. As a matter of fact, I do. I can tell you exactly what you should buy. Hold on a second, let me grab it because it's sitting right here. If you want to edit HDR content and have a monitor to see said HDR content, then the best thing that I can recommend is buy an Atomos Ninja Inferno. Because, as you undoubtedly know, the Ninja Inferno is an HDR monitor. You can plug your computer into this, and this just becomes another screen on your Mac. And so if you're writing in Final Cut or Premiere or whatever, you set this as your, uh, what's it called, your, your preview monitor? I think that's right. Um, and then you'll get to see in all of its HDR goodness right there. So that is the recommendation. So that's $1,000, which is uh, probably probably a good price. Can, if just for the monitor itself, it's probably a reasonably good price for an HDR monitor. And then obviously you get the full recording capabilities and everything else that's in it. But that is a really nice byproduct of it being an HDR monitor plug it into your computer, and off you go. It means you could be editing in the field even. You get this thing, plug it into your, even if you're not doing HDR, plug this thing into your laptop, and now you've got a, a reference monitor, which is pretty slick. I, it's a pretty, pretty cool thing that you can do. So that would be my recommendation. Of course, I don't know how much money you're thinking of spending or what you're looking at so far as far as HDR monitors, but that is definitely what I would recommend you do. Uh, let's see here. Charles Cohen says, your Mercedes shoot in part has convinced me to go micro four thirds. Awesome. Long time Nikon DSLR guy. Thoughts on Olympus versus Panasonic and the new G9 rumors. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. Olympus versus Panasonic, as you probably know by now, I am sponsored by Panasonic. So I'm a Lumix luminary. So I'm clearly going to say Panasonic is the, is the preferred route. I started in Olympus with micro four thirds and then I moved over to Panasonic the the earliest reason, I might have covered this in that Mercedes video, but the earliest reasoning for that was simply that um, I had, I bought an Olympus body and probably had an Olympus lens or two, but the, some of the lenses that I wanted were Panasonic, so I started buying those and it was just kind of like, well, I'm buying more Panasonic lenses than Olympus lenses. Then I looked at the Panasonic bodies. I think I had a GX7, if I remember right, was the first Panasonic body and, um, and it just kind of evolved from there. And then of course, now that I'm sponsored, I'm obviously shooting all all Panasonic. Um, if you are 
if you're interested in video, if you're doing video, then Panasonic really is the, the clear winner here. The GH5 is a phenomenal camera, but even if you go down from this, they're all still phenomenal for video. Um, not to say the, the Olympus cameras aren't great, they are. There's some really, really nice Olympus gear out there, but uh, my personal recommendation is going to be Panasonic. Uh, but I'm glad you like that. Um, as far as the G9 rumors, that is, until there's an official announcement from Panasonic, then there's nothing to say, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I know what you're talking about. I saw the same thing on Facebook this morning. So, eh, who knows? We will see what happens. Um, Achita, don't forget to put the app photo Joseph in front of it. You're saying, have I tried this Yongi Speed Booster 2 yet? I have not. I, did I know? I think I think that came across my radar recently. And I thought, ooh, that's clever. Um, let me look that up. Because if I remember right, that was a considerably less expensive alternative to the uh, the Metabone Speed Booster, right? So let's just see. Zhong, oops, let's spell this properly. Z H O N G Y I. I hope that's right. Speed Booster. Let's see what happens. And let me get a couple things off of my screen here. And there we go. That's done. Okay, here we go. 150 bucks. It definitely is a lot cheaper. Look at that. Wow. Um, Hmm, interesting. Look, it's not B&H, so let's see here if they've got... So there's my M42 lens to micro four thirds, 0.726x. Interesting. Interesting. So this one is a uh, micro four thirds lens to which mount? M42 mount. Oh, that's the screw mount. Okay, so that's obviously not what we would most likely want. But um, if we go back, I think I saw one that said Nikon or Canon on it. There's a Nikon to micro four thirds. Perfect. And there's Canon. That's what I would buy. Right? Is that the one to micro four thirds? Yep. That would be the one. This is what I would need. Interesting. Huh. Well, that is pretty cool. That is definitely very cool. It is certainly worth looking at. Um, wow. So then now it's like doing a comparison of that versus the official Metabones one and seeing where the quality. Now, now we got to show. Now we got to show that's okay. Hmm. I shall have to look into this. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Excellent. Uh, XT 500 C says, are you planning on reviewing the updated Mevo Plus? I am, as a matter of fact. One is en route to me. I wonder, oh, no, my phone with me. I wonder, I think it's coming, I think it's coming this week. I think it's Wednesday, if I remember right. Maybe it's tomorrow. Anyway, it's coming. So I do have one on its way to me. I'm very excited about that. And I will, uh, I will absolutely be reviewing it and talking about it and testing it and playing with it. So it'll be good fun. The super cool thing is that means I'll have two Mevos now, so I can do a multi-cam Mevo thing, which I've never been able to do before. I'm excited about that. That'll be fun. So yes, I will be taking a look at that. It's not a huge amount of changes to it, right? The biggest changes, as far as I could tell, was about uh, the range and better interference protection, whatever you call that, um, which is great because those are I had interference issues with mine. So hopefully this will be uh, this will solve all those problems. I'm very excited about that. Uh, Mark Paul Cordero is saying I reformat every time talking about those drop frames. It happens on both GH5s. Could it just be a slow card? I was using a V30 or V60, but it was happening when filming 1080p. Oh, that is weird. Um, I I think I mean there's slow cards, but then there's just could be a damaged card as well. If I would grab another card and give it a try and see if you can reproduce it. If, if you're able to reproduce it across multiple cards and you have multiple GH5s, I'm honestly at a loss. You certainly should not be dropping any frames while recording, especially at 1080p. I mean, you shouldn't anyway, um, but 1080p, come on, there's no reason. So some, I, I'm, I'm going with the card. I'm, I'm thinking there's something wrong with the card, maybe a faulty controller, uh, bad sectors, I don't know. But yeah, I'm going with the card on this one. So that's, that's the best I can rec uh, recommend for you. Um, Silly says, the Xiongzi is nice, Roxen is just as nice but cheaper. What, there's another mm, uh, speed booster type of a product? Roxen, R-O-X-S-E-N, is that what you said? Um, sorry, let's put the chat up like this. Roxen, well, that ain't it. Um, Roxen. Sully, let me know, confirm what, I just typed in Roxen and I got something totally weird. Let's try that again. Roxen, maybe it auto-corrected. Nope, it's showing, showing the results for Robin. R-O-X-S-E-N, come on. Don't re-spell everything for me. No. B&H has got nothing. So let me know uh, if that's right, and I will look it up. Uh, let's see here. Let's scroll back up to the comments here. I think there's something I've gone past. Oh, here we go. Um, uh, Nahuin says, does any Panasonic flash have an autofocus assist lamp? The one in the camera doesn't work for me. Yes. There's, I don't think it glows red like, I used to shoot Canon, and I know my Canon strobes would put out this red beam. It has an LED light built into it, which you can use for video, but it's quite dim. Um, 
which I think will double as an auto AF assist. I don't know if it does the whole red beam thing. I honestly don't, I don't know. That's something I always turn that kind of stuff off because I don't want <clears throat> you know, light scattering all over my scene when I'm trying to take a picture and people are like, oh, what's this laser target on me? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Sorry, if you want to post that question again in a comment elsewhere um, on this video or somewhere else after the show, I will, uh, I will look into that for you. But it's something I'm going to have to pull it out and play with. Um, let's see here. Uh, did we sort of miss anything up here? I did not miss anything before. All right, going back down again. This is the AMA. Any questions you want, toss them into the comments here, into the, uh, into the chat. SRO Digital says, what is your usual image aspect ratio, 4332, et cetera, setting that you use on the Lumix Micro Four Thirds for photos and why? Oh, that's easy. 43, the full size, because that is the native aspect ratio of the camera. So I want to use the full size sensor. I don't want to crop out the sensor, right? If I set the camera to 32, which you can, of course, do, all you're doing is cropping out part of the sensor, you're not using the whole thing. Now, what's really cool about it is even if you set it to 32 or 16 by 9 or whatever, which I will do on occasion if I'm, let's say, when, if I'm shooting a, uh, uh, an image for this show to use as the, the thumbnail. Obviously, it's a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, so I'll actually set the camera to 16 by 9 so that when I'm framing it up and positioning whatever I'm positioning in the shot, I can see the aspect ratio of what it's going to be like. If I'm shooting JPEG or RAW plus JPEG, that JPEG does come in at 16 by 9. The RAW file, however, and this is so cool, the RAW file shows 16 by 9 in the camera. Obviously, you see 16 9 when you're framing it up. But when you bring it into Lightroom, you will see the full 4-3 aspect ratio with the 16 by 9 crop or whatever you chose, crop already applied to it. So you can undo that crop and fix and you know fix it, re reframe it if you want to, which is really neat. But so if you're shooting RAW, you're always shooting 4-3. It's just that it's already applied the crop. And if you are um, shooting JPEG, then you're actually cropping it. But there's no benefit to cropping it. You're not, unless you're shooting just JPEG, I suppose you're not going to be saving any file size. So there's really no reason uh, to do anything other than that. The other thing I like about 4.3, so I used to shoot Canon, which is a 3.2 aspect ratio. Now when I look at Canon shots or Nikon, I think it's the same. They feel very wide to me. 4.3 is closer to square. Remember, 3.2, it's you know 50% longer in one direction than the other. Um, for three, it's less of a difference. It's more closer to square. And I've, at first, I didn't like it because um, I was just so used to the three to aspect ratio. But once I got used to it, I came to appreciate that it's closer to square. And remember, the whole purpose of square, if you look at a Hasselblad camera, the beauty of square was that you could crop out a horizontal or a vertical picture from any shot without sacrificing resolution. We're talking about film, sacrificing, sacrificing um, data there. But also, it meant for things like magazine layouts, you could kind of more easily reconform. Whereas if you're shooting wide and you decide that you need a vertical shot out of that, you're, you got a lot of scene that you're throwing away. So um, anyway, that's one of those things. So I, I really like the 4-3 aspect ratio now. If it was totally square, I'd be down for that too. Uh, all right, Dave Dell Studio, when using a fixed aperture zoom lens, say the 2.8, why can't you see the f-stops in video mode? How do you control the aperture in video mode? Um, why can't you see the f-stops in video mode? Uh, I don't know what you, I'm not quite sure what you mean. This is a variable aperture lens. So do I have another one here? Um, Ryan, grab me what lens do I want? You know, any fixed, any non-zoom. Oh wait, you said zoom. Hold on. Uh, yeah, zoom. Okay, I need. Uh, give me the 35 to 200, the 35 to 100 2.8. I believe it is in the drawer. Thank you. Okay, I'll see. I'll I'll see what it is you mean. Um, so I'm going to come back to your question once I have that in my hand. Charles Cahoon says, what is the best Micro Four Thirds lens for wide angle landscape? I know it's a loaded question, but I'm wondering about purchasing an adapter for wider APS-C or full frame prime. Um, if you want, do you want zoom? Perfect, thank you. Um, if you want wide, okay, the 24, I don't actually own this lens, but everybody who does, who has it, loves it. It's not 24, it's 12. There's a, a prime Leica, is it 12 millimeter? Um, let me find this. That is, people love, 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 love this lens. Um, is it 12? Lumix Leica, there's the 15, 25, 42, no. Hmm, I'm gonna find the right lens. Um, so I'm looking at the Noctocron here, you just see what I'm looking at here. So this is, if you, you probably want wider than this, that's a 30 millimeter equivalent, but I do absolutely love this lens. So that's one to consider. Um, the Noctogon is obviously a bit longer. Uh, the Sumalux 25. Here, yeah, this is it, the 12th. I was right. So this lens right here, if you want a really high quality wide angle lens, that is going to be your 
go-to right there. Um, obviously, it's quite pricey, 1300 bucks. This is not cheap, but this is like a glass. Um, again, I do not own a copy of this lens, but everybody who I know who has it absolutely raves about this lens. So this really fast aperture, what does that really mean? Because you're not going to get shallow depth of field at, at pretty much any, any uh, aperture, um, even at 1.4, when you're shooting a wide landscape kind of thing, it doesn't really matter. So where this comes into play is low light. Low light performance is better. So if you're shooting landscapes in lower light, um, even if you open it up all the way and you, you know, if your landscape scenes are off in the distance, it's not, your depth of field is not gonna be a problem, but you get that extra light gathering capability. And of course, being a Leica lens, it's super, super sharp. So again, everybody I know who has one thinks it's fantastic. I just don't have it, but that would be my recommendation. If you need something less expensive than that, um, hmm. let's just see what else we got here. If you wanted to spend less than that, let's, uh, you know what, hey, let's do this. Let me look up the Lumix lens lineup. Um, uh, let's go here, we'll do this. Go to Panasonic's own website. This will be the easiest way to see this. And I can look at just their lenses. Um, okay, here we go. So let's go for wide zoom. Did you say zoom or fixed? Um, did you say zoom or fixed? Did you say zoom or fixed? I don't remember what you said. I'm trying to find the comments now. It's like scrolled off screen already. Uh, there it goes. Um, best microphone lens for wide angle landscape. Okay, you're not specifying zoom or not, Charles. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know. We'll just see what we got. We just do wide zoom and and fix. Well, I don't want to do fixed. Let's just do. I guess well, whatever. Okay, so 12 to 60. That's not that wide. I mean, that's it's the same width, but um. That's your more standard, you know, zooming in lens. Um, and that's the $500 one. That's not the Leica one. The Leica one is double that price and is definitely a better lens. So there's that 12 millimeter we just looked at. So definitely recommend that. Uh, the 7 to 14, actually, this is a pretty good lens. Um, I've had this one for a long time, but now that the 8 to 18 is out, I prefer that one. Uh, a little bit less distortion on the edges on the 8 to 18. So 15, 25, 12 to 35, 12 to 32, the fisheye. Okay, so, well, and then there's this 20 millimeter. This is really inexpensive little lens, so that's always an option as well. I'm, you haven't, again, given me a price range, but um, money not being an object in this 12, where to go, this guy right here is the one that I would be looking at. Um, it, feel free to expand your question, and I'll come back to it and see if there's anything else that, uh, anything else I can help you with there. Okay, so the question about the zoom and the aperture. Let me find that question again on here. Um, here we go. This was from Dave Dell Studio. When using a fixed aperture zoom lens, say the 2.8, why can't you see the f-stops in video mode? All right, so you haven't said what mode you're shooting in, but if I, if I go to manual, then I know that I'll see it. So I'm going to assume you're talking about a, um, uh, a semi-automatic mode, like in shutter priority, which it does not show you, which is an, an annoyance, um, and it's a feature request that I have asked for. Uh, I'd like to be able to see the aperture in real time on the screen as I'm as it's changing. I just want to know what the camera is choosing. So that's that might be what you're talking about. But let me just see here. Let's turn this on. Let's go into video mode. Um, mm -hmm. F stop in video. Okay, so we're in. Let's bring up. I'm in full manual right now. Let's get the display up all the way. And then I will share the screen with you. It is syncing through. Okay, here we go. Oh, we need to hold on a second. I need to turn the menu system on so you can see the menu. And HDMI for info display on. There we go. Okay, so now you see what the camera sees. So I am in manual mode right now. You can see that there. So I'm in manual, which means let's set the uh, shutter at 180 degree. So the aperture is, I am seeing that. So on the bottom left there, you can see the aperture changing as I'm spinning the dial. So presumably you're talking about if you're in shutter priority mode, you do not see. So there I'm sh shutter priority. So it's 180 degrees. I'm not seeing the aperture um, while doing that. Now I think think. Let me see here. Was there a way? Right. That's probably what you're talking about. It just doesn't show you what the aperture is at any point there, does it? It, it is annoying. I, I will concur with that. Um, turn off my waveform that's showing up on my screen. Yeah, I don't think there's anything to do about that. Uh, I really don't. If you go into, oops, wrong mode. If I go into aperture mode here, after priority, then there I'm seeing my aperture, but I'm not seeing the shutter speed or shutter angle that it's choosing. Um, I think it's the same with ISO. If I go to auto ISO, wait, auto ISO, then that that info blinks out and you don't see that either. No, this is, that's probably what you're talking about and it is definitely an annoyance. It doesn't, ha it's not because it's a fixed aperture lens, it doesn't matter what aperture, what you put on there, right? I mean, that would be really weird. 
let's just try that. Let me put this variable one on here. This is the 12 to 60, 2A to F4. I do not expect it to be any different as far as what it's displaying. Go into a shutter priority again. Yeah, same thing. So that's what I expected. So yeah, that's a drag. Um, and I don't, I don't have a good answer for you as to why. Believe me, I have asked for it. So assuming that's what you're talking about, if that's not what you're talking about, let me know. And I will uh, come back to it. All righty, here we go. Just Simply Brendan, I just got home from work to answer your question as to why I got my iPhone 10 at Costco. Oh, right, because <laughs> he said he bought it at Costco and I was wondering why. I'm part of Costco's Verizon plan. Oh, okay. My sister upgraded her 5S to 16 gig and the 732 for only $200. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Right, so that's why you did it at Costco. All right, makes sense. Okay, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. Trevor says, oops, yeah, just popped off the screen. Trevor says, did you ever get your Russian lenses properly mounted to your GH5? No, not yet, Be only because I just kept forgetting to go back to it. It is, in fact, on Ryan's to-do list to go back and look at the comments because a couple of people had said what mounts I actually need, and I was just cleaning up some stuff, and I was like, oh, looking at these lenses going, man, I've never been able to shoot with these things. So Ryan's going to look that up, and I'm going to get that adapter. Um, he's probably going to do that today, right, Ryan? There you go. He's going to do that today. So then I can, because I do, I, want, I really want to play with that thing. I think it's super cool. Um, so I will, I'll do another show on this once I get those things properly adapted. It'll be more successful than the last show where I tried to put them on and nothing happened. Uh, Gabriel says, I'm looking to buy a GH5. Ooh, good decision. And I've seen sites such as 4K for less where it runs for about $1,650. Whoa. Um, that seems a little bit too cheap. That seems gray market to me. That's a $1,999 or $95 or whatever, $2,000 retail camera. That's a little bit too cheap. That's got to be gray market. I wouldn't. I would not buy it. 4K for less. Okay, now I have to go look at this website. Uh, let's just see. 4K for less.com. Never heard of it. Let's see what it is. Uh -huh. Oh, there's all kinds of fun toys. Mm, so this is the website. 4K for less. Uh, some cheap bundles there. Hmm. <laughs> let's just see what the GH5 is on here. GH5. What are they showing? Twenty four hundred dollars sixteen sixty nine. That's that's kind of crazy good deal. Uh, let's see here. Limited one year warranty. Sale ends at midnight. Well, okay, so there's that. But I can't imagine why this would be on such a huge discount if it's not gray market. Um, hmm. And just so you know, the reason you don't want to buy a gray market is is because of the warranty. Um, you will not be able to get your camera serviced in this country or the country that you live in if that's not where it was destined for when it was made. Um, this doesn't say, let's see here, let's see, is 4K for less gray market. Let's see what Google has to say. Um, experience with, here we go, experience with on DP review, um, doo -doo -doo. 4K for less. Someone on the website says 70 for bundle, same bundle, 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 bundle. Let's see what other people are saying. No, no one's responded to it. Okay, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to say that they are gray market because I don't know anything about them. But that price to me seems way too cheap. So I, my assumption is going to be that it's gray market. Be careful. Um, if you decide to buy from them and it is gray market, then again, that means you're not going to be able to get the camera serviced in your country of origin. If uh, I'm just, if you're U.S. based, then and that's not from here, then you won't be able to. Um, get that service here and that could be a problem. So I would definitely not recommend buying gray market. If you find out that they are totally legit and they're just having an epic sale, then great. Um, I prefer to buy from companies like B&H. So generally when I'm buying my camera gear, I either buy from B&H or Amazon. I buy from B&H if I have any questions about the product whatsoever, I will buy from B&H because I can ask them anything and their, their pre-sale and post-sale support is phenomenal. So lighting that I buy, tripods, stuff like that, I get it all from B&H. If I know exactly what I want, I've already done my research, I don't need any hand-holding at all, I will probably buy from Amazon only because I get the free, I, you know, I'm a Prime member, so I get the free shipping. Um, prices are usually identical. So that's, that's pretty much the only reason I would buy from Amazon over B&H. I prefer to send B&H my money because um, they're a dedicated camera store, obviously, and they're awesome, so that's, that's my recommendation. Clearly, there are stores, camera stores all over the place. If you happen to be in a, um, uh, you've got a retail store that you can go to and you're going to walk in, uh, like my friends at uh, Image One down in LA, then you, obviously, if you're going to walk into their store, then you need to buy in their store without question. If you're going to take half a second of a salesman's time, then you owe it to them to buy in their store. Um, and obviously, shopping local is a great thing. I don't have a camera store around here for like 500 miles, so there's I don't have any choice. But if you've got a good camera store to go into, then That'd be a good way to go. Um, 
that's that. Okay, Mark says, Mark Botcodero says, can I, oh, how can I send you a link to a sample footage I just shot in 4K, ooh, with the Zeohan Green Crane 2? Can't put a link in the comments, you are correct. You are in the two minutes. Um, okay, uh, Mark, you can shoot me an email. Uh, if you don't know my email address, then just go to the go to photojoseph.com and the contact page there, or you can tweet it to me as well. Um, but yeah, just go to photojoseph.com, there's a contact page, you can pop it over to me there. Um, let's see here, where are we, where are we? Sully says, how does the 8 to 18 compare to the Olympus 7 to 14? Never shot with the Olympus 7 to 14, but I can tell you that the 8 to 18 is, in my opinion, better than the Panasonic 7 to 14. I am, um, I think image quality is a little bit higher. It feels like there's less distortion around the edges. So I am, and the 7 to 14 was a good lens, uh, but it feels like there's a bit less distortion around the edges. So I am really, really digging that 8 to 18. I think it's a beautiful lens. I'm stoked that I've got it now. Marvin says, I couldn't afford the 12 millimeter, so I got a secondhand 15, and it's been awesome. Use it for night time lapses, and it gets meteors too. So you're talking about the 15 uh, Leica, I'm assuming. That's that Sumalux or whatever. The Leica lens 15 F17. Beautiful lens. Beautiful lens. One of my favorites for sure. Um, Evtonic, you had a question here. I'm going to, where did it go? Now it just flew off the screen. Are the smartphone lenses getting better and bigger? What is keeping Apple or Samsung from going all out with real camera on the phone? Well, define real camera. It is a real camera. It's got a lens and a sensor. It's a real camera. Um, size. I mean, anything, is, it all has to do with size. There's I don't know where this actually ended up in the world of science and tech and whether this is a reality or fantasy or what, but I had heard somewhere along the way that you could make a lens that is made of liquid and through electronic um, pulses, I guess, whatever, changing the current through it, you could change the shape of it, effectively giving you a um, an autofocus lens or even a zoom lens without moving parts. It's just the liquid in the lens changes. It sounds like crazy mad science awesomeness to me. You put that inside of a smartphone and you get a, a you know, totally different type of lens in there. Um, but you still have to remember, you, know, you only got this much space. You keep in mind, you got to have distance for the lens. You know, this is a big, you don't really want this attached to the front of your smartphone. It'd be kind of hard to put in your pocket. But they're, they're certainly getting better and better. And then you've got things like that light camera where it puts 16 lenses on there and it does some weird magic and it stitches things together. Uh, looks very interesting. I think I could totally see that type of technology coming to smartphones. Computational photography is what this is called when you start getting more into what the computer is doing for the picture to stitch things together, to do image enhancement, to go beyond what the quality of that camera lens and sensor would be on its own. And it's phenomenal what's happening. It truly is. And the quality of these things is just getting better and better all the time. Um, so I don't know really what the answer to the question is. You know, there's no anything holding them back. They are just pushing the envelope as far as they can with every new release. You know, the iPhone 10's got an even better camera than the iPhone uh, 7 had. The new, was it the, was it the Pixel? One of the newest uh, Android phones just got the highest rating ever on DxO Mark. So, you know, it's, uh, it's exciting stuff. It absolutely is. Um, Daveville Studio, yes, was related to shutter or aperture. I'm talking about the, the problem on there. So, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Charles Cohen, thanks. Zoom or fixed lens is less important than overall width. Need, oh, field of view. Need a four-third solution to a full-frame wide angle for possibly less than 1,200. Um, I shoot Montana and where and where we dances with wolves. Um, cool. Montana's beautiful. Um, that 8 to 18 is going to give you the widest. If you if the 12 isn't wide enough, then the 8 to 18 is probably your option. But how much is that lens? I don't even remember. Um, 8 to 18 is it might be over 1,200. Oh no, it's 1100, there you go. So if you don't, that's a little bit slower than the 12, obviously the 12 is a one, one two or one four, whatever it was. Um, so there you go, and they're for about the same price. So I would look at those. Do you want zoom? If you want zoom, then I would go for this one to get you that wide. If you don't want zoom or don't need zoom um, and you or you prefer to have the faster lens, then I would go for the, great, where'd it go? There it is, uh, there, the 12 1.4. So that's, those are my two recommendations for you. Hopefully one of those is actually useful for you. Alrighty, Trevor says, yeah, that's one of those New York stores. You have to be super careful with those guys, the 4K for less or whatever. Thank you very much. If you're not used to dealing with those distribution channels, don't. Thank you, Trevor, for sharing that with me. Um, go to legit brick and mortar route or go or used on eBay with high feedback. That's always a good option too. I don't know how many GH5s you're going to find used out there right now, but there might be some out there. Uh, yeah, don't buy grid market. Don't, don't do it. David L. Studio, does the new video lock work on non-stabilized lenses or is it a dual IS feature only? 
That's a good question. Um, mm, okay, so I need a lens that does not have stabilization. Let me grab this lens here. Because this does not have IS in the lens itself. So what he's asking, there is a feature in the GH5 with the firmware update version 2 called Video Lock. It's an extra label, label, extra layer of stabilization. And in fact, here, let me do this first. Let me, with this on here, I'll show you it in the menu. And then we're going to pop that lens on and see if it shows up again. I, I don't know the answer to this question, but that's what we can do here is find out in real time. Okay, let me find it first before I switch over to this. You don't see me hunting around all over the place. Um, I think it's in the video menu. Video, shoes, description, stabilizer, there we go. Okay, so we are at here. Um, we're in the, the video, I always forget what it's called, motion picture menu, there we go. Page three or four, stabilizer, e-stabilization, IS lock. This is what you're talking about, IS lock on the video. I will need to do a video about this at some point, but it won't, I don't think I really can do this one live. Maybe I can. Um, I will do a video around this because it's a new feature that we really haven't talked about yet. So anyway, um, but not today. But for now, let's just see. So there's, it's available. So we can see that obviously offer on. So now I'm going to pull off this lens and put the a lens that does not have stabilization in it. I should probably should make sure this does not have stabilization. No. Well, maybe it does. Hmm. Maybe it does have stabilization. What does it say on the front? I honestly don't know. It's, oh yeah, Mega OIS, it does. Mm, okay, so that's optical image stabilization. Okay, so I need a lens that doesn't have stabilization. Um, hmm. I know. Uh, oh, actually, hold on a second. I probably can do it like this. Yes, okay, aha, perfect. There's no lens on here, obviously, which um, would mean the same thing would happen whether I put on, if I put on a mechanical lens that doesn't have any, um, any even electrical contact with the camera, right? Like that Zhongyi lens that I love so much. If I put that on here, the camera effectively does not think that there's a lens there. So if I go into the menu now and I look, I see under stabilizer that IS lock video is still available, even though the camera does not think there's a lens on here. So that is, um, I'm going to go with a, a yes on that. I think that's a, yeah, I didn't know that little thing had stabilizer. That's kind of cool for the, whoever it was that asked earlier about this lens, this 35 to 100, it's got stabilization in it. Let's see if it does, let me put that on here. What does it show me for the optical? So here, let me do this. Back and forth, back and forth. If you look at the stabilization menu, let me turn this IS lock thing back off. Um, okay, so now if you look at the menu up in the top right, you'll see it says dual two. So that's dual dual stabilization, meaning in the, in the body and in the lens, and that's version two. If the, the lens is an older lens, it won't show the two, it'll just show the dual. But what we want to find out now is if I put this lens on here, does it give me dual or not? Let's see what it says. Let's rotate the zoom lens. Um, it is not giving me dual. So if you look at that, you can see there it is up in the top right corner, you get the hand telling me that I am getting stabilization, but it is not dual stabilization. Um, and again, there's that IS lock video. I can turn that on. Um, I can turn it off here if I want to turn off the stabilization entirely. If you're wondering, by the way, if you're looking at your lens and you don't have this option in here, this operation mode, that is because your lens has a hardware switch. When the lens has a hardware switch to turn off the stabilization, that menu is disabled because it's here. Good to know. Um, yeah, so the IS lock on video apparently works no matter what lens you've got on there. That's pretty cool. And that little lens is a nice little lens. That's, that's great. Nice little lens. Okay, cool. Uh, next up, let's see here. Just simply Brandon says, is it redundant to have a Department of Redundancy department? Um, is it redundant to have both the Noctocron and Voigtlander 42.5 lenses, or is the Voigtlander's faster aperture and Noctocron's power OIS and glass justifiable enough to get both? Voigtlander's, I thought it was a 1.2 as well, wasn't it? I thought it was the same aperture. Uh, let's go to B&H, and where's, no, where's my B&H star? Oops, I guess I closed that window. B and H, Voigtlander 42.5. Let's see here. Voigtlander 42.5. Survey says, oh, the 0.95. Whoa. Wow. Slick. <laughs> Color me surprised. Never shot with it. I really couldn't tell you. Um, the added stabilization is probably more because the stabilization, when you get the dual IS, dual OIS, dual image stabilization, between the body and the lens, you're getting, what are they saying, three stops or something like that? Uh, so, I don't know. That's a tough call. 
that's a tough call. I can't, I, and not having ever shot with the lens, I have no idea the quality of it. Voigtlander obviously has a reputation for making very good gear, so that could be could be quite nice. It's um, it's going to be fully manual, right? These are not autofocus at all. Um, that's incredible, 0.95 on a 42 and a half millimeter lens. Just phenomenal. Love this stuff. Love it. One super high refractive element. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you're. Let me read your question again. Um, is it different enough to? Ju I don't think it'd be justified to get both. I can't imagine really there being enough of a difference to need both of them. I would probably just get one or the other. I mean, we're not talking about cheap lenses here to begin with. Although that Voigtlander is a lot cheaper than the Noctocron, right? That's 800 and um, what was the Noctocron? Uh, let's just go Panasonic, 42.5, not that one, um, 1600, so it's half the price. That's a pretty big difference. I don't know. I, you'd have to look at the reviews on it. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better, better answer for you, but it's a hell of a deal for that lens, it seems, at that speed. If it's a good lens, then, hmm. and I'm, again, I'm assuming it's not autofocus. I don't know. You, someone could correct me, but um, which obviously might be important to you. But there you go. If it is a stepless aperture, I didn't see that noted there. If it's a stepless aperture, then that be, can be quite good for video if you want to be able to adjust the aperture um, while you're shooting video. That can be quite cool to have. Anyway. All right. Let's see here. Daddy MCC says, where'd it go? So. I love it when it does that. Anyway, added value of buying the GH5 from B&H is that they are throwing in the V-Log for free. Oh, I didn't know that. That's a nice added, that's a very nice added value. Uh, how, how very cool. I had no idea. Good, well, there you go. B&H, if you're gonna buy from B&H, use my link below, please. Um, Astoro Digital says, so are you going to use the 8 to 18 instead of it's 7 to 14 for real estate jobs now that you have the 8 to 18? I will, next real estate shoot that I have, which, um, oh, I think it's that Wednesday. I think it's this week. I'm actually not shooting. I've been hired by a uh, real estate agency to consult with them on how to get better photos and videos using their GH5 and 8 to 18. So that'll be my first time seeing the 8 to 18 in a real estate shoot. I don't do that many of them. So I haven't done one since I got the lens, but on the next one that I do, I would bring both and um, do a little side by side and compare and see, but I, I fully plan on, expect that I would be using the 8 to 18. That 7 to 14 is probably just gonna be collecting dust for a while now. 18 is beautiful. It really is a great lens. Okay, keep on going. Charles Cahoon says, thoughts on ISO performance between G85, GH5, GX8 with no anti-aliasing. Um, great stream, thanks. Well, you're quite welcome. Well, the GH5 is going to give you the best low light performance, high ISO performance, because it has the most advanced processors in it. It's got the most advanced sensor, right? It is everything newest, latest, greatest is in this camera. No anti-aliasing filter as well. Right, it's the best of the best there is right now. Um, the G85 is the same sensor as the GX85, and uh, I can't, I, I mean, I can't say low light performance. I, okay, that's the one that I brought to Mexico. Um, did a bunch of stills and video with that camera, the GX85, so the same sensor, in Oaxaca, and it is phenomenal. And that's also the camera that I did the whole New Orleans thing on. Um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Low light performance is great. This is better. So, GX8 is older yet again, right? The GX8 is now two years old. I think that's right. Maybe even more. G85 is a little over a year, year and a half old. Maybe there's not that much of a difference in time between the G85 and the GX8. I honestly don't remember. I really don't remember. I would say those two cameras are probably pretty equivalent in low light performance. It was when you went to the GH5 that we saw a, a market improvement. And again, it's because of the new um, Digic whatever processors that are in this camera. So. If you're looking for the best high ISO performance, then the GH5 is going to be the one to get today. Uh, Shiva Kumar says, did you see the leak or rumor about the G9 on Facebook? I did see that leak or rumor or whatever you want to call it. And my thoughts are, I will not have a thought until Panasonic actually releases something officially. So it sounded cool, uh, but you know, it's all speculation as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so I don't know. Let's see. Anything else? Ooh, that's it. Let me scroll back up in the comments. Um, if there's nothing else popping up in the, in the next couple of minutes here, then we're going to wrap this show up and see if there's anything that I missed. I don't think so. So Friday, I got a plan. I got a fun plan for Friday. So here's what we're going to do on Friday for the GH5. Oh, GH5. Wow. For the iPhone 10 arrival. We'll go live not at the normal time. We will go live not just as soon as the phone arrives, but at some point beforehand, we're going to go live with a camera on the door waiting for my UPS driver 
to come by and drop off the lens. I think it's going to be fun. So we'll have a little kind of a pre-show, which I don't know how long that pre-show will be. Um, I've got a good relationship with my UPS driver, so I'm, he's, I think, going to be coming by today to drop something off. So I'm hoping that I can talk to him and see if I can get him to give me a heads up on when he's on his way over here so that I can start shooting, start rolling. It's going to be fun. Uh, we're going to get that and we're going to open that up right away. Hey, did you guys see the porch chap at Apple who let his daughter film the iPhone 10 and put it on YouTube? He's not working at Apple anymore. That's unfortunate. God, you can't do that, man. I don't know what he was thinking. I mean, that's a pretty boneheaded maneuver. He's obviously a smart guy. He's an engineer at Apple. But that was a pretty boneheaded maneuver. Sorry, buddy. Hope that you uh, find gainful employment elsewhere without too much, uh, too much delay. Yeah, don't let your kid film and put on YouTube unreleased hardware prototype. It's no bad idea. Bad. Okay. Anything else in the comments here? We're going to bail out. Let's see here. Uh, oh, there are more questions. Do, do, do. Uh, Silly says, just got notification my iPhone 256 gig has shipped. Excellent. Yep, mine. One on my phone in front of me. Um, if you did order an iPhone and you're wondering when it's coming and you haven't gotten an updated ship notification from Apple yet, log into your UPS account. If you don't have one, just make one. And then you, once you enter your address, it does some magic where it goes, oh, name, address, match. Here's a package that's coming to you. And you may see that the label has been generated. And um, in my case this morning, I could see it already checked through one checkpoint in China, whereas Apple hadn't even yet updated the status to say that it shipped, but it in fact is shipping. So that's very cool. Uh, Mark says your delivery date has not changed. Sorry to hear that, buddy. Um, Esther Digital says Friday, shouldn't that be a double Mevo Friday? Um, what's an iPhone 10? Yeah, I think, I think we won't be using the Mevo for Friday. This Friday is going to be an iPhone Friday. Trevor, have you had an opportunity to shoot either the 6K anamorphic? I don't have any anamorphic lenses or 400 megabit all intro. I haven't even shot all, all 400 megabit all intro yet. I know it's ridiculous. Um, just too many other things going on. I have not yet. The quality boost is substantial for the right subjects. Excellent. But the all intro takes uh, burns card as fast. Yeah, well, yes, it would. 400 megabit, that's a lot of data. Um, yeah, it is going to chew through cards. And actually, that's the other thing. I don't actually have any V90 cards. Details, you know. Little things. Got a business to run. I can't be buying cars all the time. Um, okay. That's that. And okay. Sim, uh, what is another real question? Okay. Uh, Paul, you sent me an email. Thank you. I will check it out. Okay. Oh, okay. Now Simbar and put the, my name in front of it. Was Panasonic that disappointed in the GX8 sales? I don't know why I say that. It's a very polarizing camera. People didn't seem to like it on paper, but most people who actually got one loved it, yourself included. I don't know if they were disappointed or not. I don't, I'm not privy to any of that information. I, Panasonic doesn't share with us, the Luminary team, whether sales were as good or bad or whatever as expected or predicted and so on. Um, we know things like the G85 was kind of a runaway success. I don't think Panasonic intended, expected it to be as successful as it was. And that is the only reason that um, you can say that is because it was hard to get. Anytime a product is hard to get, it's a pretty good indication that um, manufacturing predictions, sales predictions didn't meet, manu sales reality didn't meet sales, meet sales predictions. It's a good way, good way to put that. If you see things severely discounted, then that's a good indication that it went the other way. Made too many, not enough people buying them, so they're cutting the price. Um, GX8, I don't recall any yay or nay on that. I really liked the GX8. It was, it was really designed, even though it does do video like all the Lumix cameras, it was really designed for the still photographer. And uh, I think it was a beautiful camera. I, I really enjoyed it. I've still got one sitting in a drawer. It's a great camera. So, um, well, let's tell you, it's nice stuff. <sighs> Seven plus a few discounts on the G85. The G85 is, that's a, that's a great value. The G85 really is. If you cannot afford a GH5, the G85 is what you should be looking at if you're trying to do video. It's a great, great camera. I know a lot of people really, really like that one. Okay. Let's wrap it up here. You know the routine, you know the drill. If you haven't subscribed, please do. If you like the video, thumbs up. If you haven't liked it, it's funny, I realized I could say, if you don't like the video, thumbs down it, but if you don't like the video, you're long gone. You're not even here. So since you're still here watching it, hey, give it a thumbs up. I appreciate that. And um, anything else to talk about in here real quick? Let's see. Uh, you guys all know about this. If you are a GH5 user, then you want my GH5 training. Even if you're not a GH5 user, if you use a Lumix camera, you will learn a lot about your camera from this course. And of course, if you are new to photography, then check out my Photography 101 course on lynda.com. Incidentally, by the way, this GH5 training course is also available on lynda.com. Just go there and search for it. But uh, for the Photo 101, you can just search for Photo Joseph on Lynda and you'll find it. Or if, uh, or if you are so inclined, if you don't have an account, you want a free 10-day trial, just type in photojoseph.com slash lynda into your browser and you'll get redirected to a, um, to a uh, landing page that'll give you a 10-day free trial, which is pretty cool.
that's it. We're going to knock it off and get out of here today. All right, guys, take care of yourselves. We'll see you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.